Good evening. How are you guys doing? Good. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Ron Latz. I'm your state senator, and we're going to start the town hall meeting now. Um, we, as you can see, we have an empty seat right now. Representative Winkler apparently is was making a presentation um, at the uh, the House DFL Legislative Caucus meeting, and uh, he'll get here as soon as he's able to. But our newly elected uh, representative Shirley Joachim is with us. My loss of a committee administrator is the gain of our district. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and, and dive right in. We, we will end at 8 o'clock. Uh, and uh, uh, we want to make this, as in the past, as much or more of a listening session than a talking session. So we encourage questions, comments, criticisms, suggestions, praise in the event that anyone has any. <laughs> Um, and uh, we welcome all of you uh, to our uh, gathering at the beginning of the legislative session to help us understand what concerns are on your mind and how we ought to address them in the legislative session. Uh, we will uh, remind you, please, if you have any questions or comments, this is being recorded for broadcast on local cable television. Uh, so if you'd step up to the podium and the microphone over there when you have questions or comments, uh, then it can be, the recording can pick up the audio uh, for the home audience. So I will simply start with a brief introduction. Uh, I've, uh, I've been in the Senate now, this is the middle of my third term, and I served two terms in the House of Representatives before that. I grew up in Golden Valley, I live in St. Louis Park. I'm married uh, to an attorney, and I'm an attorney. We have three children, uh, and we have a busy household. Um, I'm a private uh, practice lawyer when I'm not at the legislature and even part-time during the legislative session. Uh, in uh, the legislature at present, I chair the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I also serve on the Commerce Committee, and I chair the Senate Finance Committee Budget Division on Judiciary, and that covers the Department of Corrections, which is basically the prisons and the community corrections or probation and parole systems in Minnesota, the uh, judicial branch, the courts, and the Department of Human Rights, as well as other related entities such as civil legal services and the public defender's office. Uh, so that's where a lot of my time is spent right now. But in addition, I carry individual legislative initiatives uh, that are specifically aimed to advance the interests of the district I represent, <coughs> St. Louis Park, Hopkins, um, part of Golden Valley, part of Plymouth, and all of Medicine Lake. And also uh, to advance the broader state interests that reflect the priorities of this district, such as education, higher education, um, early childhood is a big initiative this year, transportation. So we can go into uh, some of those details uh, as uh, the evening moves along, no questions uh, with, within reason are <laughs> out of line. Uh, and uh, I'll just give us two seconds of what I think are the key issues this year. Uh, we are in the beginning of our budget setting session now. Every two years, we set the budget for the following two-year biennium. So by the end of this legislative session, certainly by June 30th, when the current budget biennium ends, we will have a new budget for the following <coughs> two-year cycle. And because we are constitutionally mandated to have a balanced budget, we will not run an operational deficit. We will have a structurally balanced uh, uh, budget. And budget making is all about policy and priority setting, because uh, where you decide to put your money has a big impact on what policies get advanced and what policies don't. So that'll take up a lot of our time this year, and that's our constitutionally dedicated obligation uh, for this cycle. Uh, there will be a lot of other policy-related stuff that we will consider as well, uh, including transportation. Southwest LRT has been a major priority of mine since I first got elected to the House, and uh, we are going to focus on trying to find a funding mechanism for it, even in the face of some headwinds uh, from those who just philosophically oppose transit, um, and from those who would find other ex ways to spend money out of our general fund um, and out of the dedicated transportation funding as well. 
So we will uh, work on that, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to go more into that as the evening progresses. So with that, um, I want to give Representative Iwakim an opportunity to speak. <coughs> Well, hello. It's nice to see a lot of friendly faces in the audience. I was a little nervous, first town hall and all, but um, my name is Cheryl Joachim, and I'm first term elected to the House, just got sworn in on January 6th. It was exciting. Um, I'm sure most of you know that the DFL is in the minority now in the House, so we didn't have a lot of options for committee assignments, but I have a, a fun list that I got on. I'm on property taxes and local government. I am also on gover government operations and elections, and then I got put on the Rules and Administration Committee too. So that's been interesting, and I have some background with being on the City Council for nine years, and the last two and a half years on the Southwest Light Rail Corridor Management Committee, and then of course the last eight years working with Senator Latz in the Senate. So. I'm happy to be able to use a little bit of that experience up at the Capitol, but I still feel like I have a lot to learn. So as a freshman, I don't know if I'll do the typical sit down and be quiet, but I will do, I will be doing a lot of listening and learning. Um, and it, it'll be a fa fascinating year. Like Senator Latt said, we are putting the budget together. Um, I think transportation is probably going to be the biggest, I don't know if I want to say fight up there, but you, you've seen the all the news articles that are coming out and the different positions that are be, being staked out pretty far apart. So um, I'm a full believer in a, funding a multimodal transit system and I'm, I'm really concerned about getting the last bit of the state share for Southwest Light Rail. So if you do support that, please, please, please feel free to contact the governor and let him know how important that is. Um, I think there's a few other issues that'll come up. We're already next tomorrow doing a tax federal tax conformity bill on the House floor to kind of line up with some of the federal tax changes and I don't think that's going to be controversial. When are you do when are you doing it in the Senate? I haven't heard where it's coming. Okay, up. so it must have to I think it has to start in the House to first. He knows procedure a little bit better than me. <laughs> so um, uh, there'll, there'll be some push on taxes and lowering property taxes a look at LGA again probably um, but otherwise, it'll just be interesting to see what issues percolate to the top this year. And that's what we're here for today is to hear what you think is important. So I don't want to take up too much more time. And should we just open it up for questions? Yeah, and I know Representative Winkler did pass on his apologies. He's going to try to get here as soon as he can. So please uh, step up to the podium and the microphone and let us know what you're thinking. Good evening. Congratulations. And welcome back, Ron. Glad you're still here. Thank you. um, as usual, I'm going to talk about, uh, for just a couple of minutes about what I'd like to see done this session in terms of early childhood. And um, I do want to say that um, I really support the Mini Minds um, approach uh, with the uh, scholarships for three to four year olds. And in their platform this year, they're also having um, uh, uh, trying to encourage children from zero to two to be eligible for scholarships to particularly very high risk uh, zero to two children, um, I mean birth to two years old. Um, and I also wanted to bring up um, the legislative priorities this year for ECFE. You know, we're sometimes like we try to do really new things, but in the process sometimes overlook uh, what the old good things that are still being done and ECFE serves um, more than 111,000 um, families um, over in, a, in any given year across the whole state in the public school system. And um, so this year um, what, what actually needs to happen is um, in the last session there was a general um, increase uh, for, for the regular ECFE programs, but there's two components that didn't uh, get any increase. And one is a home visiting component and the other is a screening uh, mandate, screening the children. And those are both mandated programs in the ECFE um, legislation. And so they really need money because they're, with, they're drawing money away from the classes and the work with the parents and I know, Cheryl, you've been really involved, well, both of you have been really involved in ECFE. Um, and then the other piece there is um, uh, increasing funding for the school readiness programs, and they're um, highly recommended through the um, 
they have the four star rating through parent aware so I just am hoping that we won't forget the ongoing programs that are really doing continued really really good work and I've got copies of these for you guys too thanks and uh, thanks for the for voting last year on the increase for ECFE in general Thank you, Mary Kay. And, and actually, if you want to give the uh, documents there to my legislative assistant, Patrick, who's sitting at the table behind you, and, and uh, we'll be sure to get those. Uh, Mary Kay has been involved in early childhood issues uh, for long <laughs> before I got onto the, uh, into the legislature, I think before I was on the city council, too. So thanks for your work. Um. Can I ask a quick question, Mary Kay? Remind me, are we even back up to per pupil formula that was cut in 2003? Um, last year, um, it went, the, the levy was raised last year, okay. so it is better than it was in 2003, but not in these areas that I just mentioned specifically. And they I, have a separate levy. I did just sign on to the school readiness funding bill the other day, so. Good. And on the all day universal preschool for four year olds. Yes, that's another good issue, right, thanks. What's nice this year, for the first time I think in a long time, <clears throat> is there seems to be a general consensus that early childhood uh, funding is, is particularly important since we got the all-day kindergarten uh, taken care of. Um, so uh, on a bipartisan basis, I'm sensing a, a, a willingness to look at uh, early childhood. The governor has made it um, a signature issue. Uh, for him and I will have some discussions about exactly what parts of the early childhood uh, universe ought to receive the appropriate funding whether it's through tax credits or other mechanisms uh, to make sure that uh, it's available and affordable for people um, but the science is quite clear on the benefits of addressing uh, early childhood issues and you know I was at the legislative action coalition meeting this morning for the Hopkins school district and uh, that was a topic of the discussion there too. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of attention being paid. And uh, you know we're going to end up with a with the sort of the age-old battle. You know we uh, between what to do with the money that we have and whether it should be used for tax cuts most productively or whether it should be directed toward areas of spending. Um, and you know that actually gives me a good platform to say something I probably should have said at the beginning, which is sort of what's the, the lay of the land on the budget situation. Um, we have projected under statute a, a, about a $1 billion budget surplus. But that term surplus is a little bit misleading uh, because by statute they account for the uh, inflation on the revenue side of the equation, but not on the spending side. So the surplus is if you take the projected revenues minus the current biennium nominal spending amounts and doesn't include calculating the increases that would be necessary under inflation to maintain the same level of services that we currently have. Yet we all know that costs do go up and population goes up in Minnesota. So to maintain the same level of services, you would actually have to add almost $900 million uh, to, the, uh, to the budget just to stay flat in terms of services delivered. Uh, there's also a provision in the statute that directs one-third of the projected surplus to go into budget reserves, the savings account that we use to uh, try to uh, mitigate the ups and downs of the, uh, the revenue stream in state government. So you know, we've, we've got a volatile revenue stream. A lot of it's dependent upon income taxes, and that notably goes up and down with the economy. And uh, when that happens, when there's a down cycle, because we have to balance the budget, we often have to cut spending that in the long term might not be the places you want to cut spending, but we're kind of forced into that quandary. So the more we have in budget reserves, the more we can uh, sort of uh, smooth out those lurches up and down. Uh, and, uh, and once you account for that, really all of that so-called $1 billion surplus is accounted for and doesn't really leave any new money for more spending. So we will not make our budget decisions based on the November forecast with the numbers I just described to you. Uh, instead, there will be a, a late February or early March forecast 
uh, that will have updated information. And the way the economy is going, we're hopeful that we'll have uh, more money that we can uh, utilize. Um, but either way, there are going to be the, the philosophical differences, the prioritization that will have to go on, which is a healthy process to go through to decide uh, you know, what's working, what's not working, uh, what can be spent better somewhere else, and what should we increase spending on because that program is working very well. Uh, but that's kind of the setup that we're going to have to deal with. And uh, everyone's got ideas about how to spend the money in the so-called surplus, and I'm sure there are far more demands um, on the money than we have uh, the ability to pay. And there's also some deficiencies that we're going to have to pay for right away, too. There's some deficiencies in the flood mitigation and disaster account. Um, there's some in some guards down in St. Peter. And then also, I'm missing one. Um, no, it was the, the, the guards, the floods, and I'll have to think of it later. But well, Deficiency spending um, is where there are more expenses than anticipated that government just had to incur uh, in the last two years, like dealing with flood mitigation. Um, you know, the Department of Corrections has an issue with, with uh, more prisoners than they have the capacity. Uh, to, to have in the state prisons, so they're housing them in local workhouses and paying counties uh, rent, basically, for the, that space. Um, and so we have to go back um, in, in these deficiency spendings and, and backfill the gap that was there before we can start projecting into the next biennium. And I just remembered the third one. It's uh, the four Ebola centers readiness that they set up across, around the state when we were going through the Ebola crisis. So. There's some money still off that so-called surplus that's going to have to go somewhere else. Plus, you know, we are hopeful that the February forecast is good, but you never know. You never know. Yes, please. My name is Jana Crofta. There are many things that I'm interested in, but I'd really like to focus on how on the shortage of affordable housing. That's a drag when children are homeless it's a real drag on their performance in school uh, when people are homeless it's a uh, very expensive in terms of human services for the policemen and, and jail time and all that kind of thing so uh, it's something that we need to constantly be working on we're asking this year for 39 million half of it to the minnesota housing finance agency and half of it to health and human services and I hope you can find that in the budget. Well, we'll certainly do all we can. Um, you know, Cheryl and I have both been strong advocates for affordable housing over the years. Um, I've carried bills to, to put extra money into outreach efforts. Uh, for uh, There's one person in particular who was over at the Capitol a lot lobbying who used to be homeless and got a job uh, working for a homeless outreach agency. And he knew exactly where to find all of the people that were still living on the street and could reach out and get them information about services available to them. And certainly when, when kids are homeless, it's particularly tragic because they don't even have the wherewithal to take care of themselves. Uh, so it, it's certainly been a priority. I know we've made, we've done some heavy lifting in the last several years as well. Uh, you know, some, like, like $100 million into, you know, homeless. Uh, efforts um, and yes. in uh, affordable housing efforts, but there's still more of a need uh, than there has been funding. So we'll certainly be taking another look at that. Yes, even with the push in the bonding bill last year with the extra money, I know there was a project in Hopkins that was trying to get off the ground. Uh, a peop uh, People for Pride and Living, wonderful project, 53 units dedicated mostly to families, and they could couldn't tap the one le portion they had left was to tap into the state funds and didn't get approval so now they're kind of starting that process over again good evening uh, I'm Roger Rydberg from Plymouth and uh, past uh, vice president of Minnesota Futurists and both energy and transportation are one of our hot topics a uh, couple of things were you aware that Norway currently is going through a test phase of buses that run solely on hydrogen generated from photovoltaic stations which are around uh, their country about six of them on in the pilot project so they lo they s they generate uh, hydrogen all day long with the photovoltaic and the buses roll up and they get two days or 200 miles running on sunlight 
and they're a prototype for the rest of Europe. The other thing is that uh, <coughs> um, the driverless cars are going to be on the scene very soon. And here's some, some ramification you might have thought about, but they think they can cut the 40,000 deaths a year in half. And along with that, of course, that raises a lot of interesting possibilities in terms of alternatives to by rail. And that uh, I guess I want to just take a look at some of that stuff because I think down the road, you know, <clears throat> you have to get to the light rail and then you have to disperse from the right light rail. What if you could do a virtual light rail with these driverless cars? Something to think about. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. Um, you know, there's a lot there. Uh, the driverless cars w would certainly help deal with the issues of inattentive driving or distracted driving. Uh, whether you're distracted by the kids in the back seat uh, or, a, uh, or a cell phone ringing um, or even worse, texting. Also, just think about babies, prostate and things, white babies. Right. Maybe that could be worth a million bucks. Right. And, and so fewer accidents uh, saves lives and saves money. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks working on the technology uh, for that. And there's a lot of issues with energy as well. One of the reasons that we've had funding issues with the state transportation system is because the gas tax, which has been the heavy lifter uh, for funding the state roads and bridges, um, is declining in, in overall revenue because cars are getting higher mileage, people are using less gas, uh, which is a good thing, but it, it creates a, a challenge for those of us who are trying to think about how to fund uh, maintaining our roads and bridges, let alone improving the transportation system to accommodate, you know, the, the economic growth that we're seeing. Yeah, I think transpor transportation will be a really interesting area to watch this year just because of that. There's everything has to be on the table. Every mode, every funding stream, we have to figure out a plan that works 50 years from now, not just the band-aid approaches that keep happening. And um, I, I hadn't heard about solar buses. That's really interesting. Larry. Yes, this is Larry Jones. Um, uh, I'm a resident of St. Louis Park. I was a resident of Cheryl's district until I moved, and now I'm a resident of Ryan's district. But um, my big issues are mental health. But I just wanted to say a little bit about transportation and that I do support a gas tax increase, um, sales tax increase or gas tax increase to support our roads, bridges, and transit. Um, I am against a license tab increase. I think that's a backhanded, backhanded form of a regressive tax against people who have to drive and so for that reason. I'm for adding, per adding to the per pupil formula as advocated by Governor Dayton. And um, in regards to mental health, the biggest issue I want to address is the medical assistance um, issue in Minnesota regarding mental health. One of NAMI Minnesota's objectives for the 2015 session is to make clubhouses such as Vail Place and um, other clubhouses, there's eight to ten clubhouses throughout Minnesota that are members of Clubhouse International and they all have 36 international standards. While several states have already instituted medical assistance um, payments for services at clubhouses. And this would allow Vail Place to expand to North Hennepin County. We're currently working with North Memorial Medical Center on a collaboration where we go from acute psychiatric hospitalization right into the clubhouse setting, which would be a very smooth transition. And this medical assistance um, funding would tremendously help in that regard. The other major issue in mental health funding is um, increasing the training for police officers to get mental health training. There's what's called the Cadillac system, um, and that's referred to as, if I can refer to my sheet here, um, the Cadillac system is referred to as Crisis Intervention Team t train Training, CIT. It's a 40-hour class that provides intensive training for police, and, and it's now used on the Minnesota in-prison staff. And um, this would really ensure that our police officers are able to deal with persons with mental illness um, in a very fashionable and very um, 
very non-offensive way that would and treat them as not treat them as criminals but treat them as the people that they are and um, that's about all I have to say and thank you very much and you've done a great job for Minnesota thank, thank you thank you Larry I, n I know that um Sue Abner Holden from NAMI has been working really closely with Senator Goodwin on on the CIT training and and I'm not sure I'm gonna have to find out who the champion is in the house I'm still trying to find my way around the the personalities over there um, but no you bring up a lot of good points and I know Vail Place is a tremendous asset to the community and I hadn't heard about the the medical ex assistance expansion so I'll have to that sounds like a great idea I'll have to look into it you know right now one of the real big bottlenecks in the system is there's no place to put to put people who are ready for discharge from the hospitals um, and so that's that's a real tragedy that they remain hospitalized longer than they need to and it also means there's no space in the hospitals for the people who need to get off of the streets and uh, when they have that interaction with the police the police have no place to take them um, and so sometimes they end up being warehoused in jail while they're waiting for hospital space now we passed a law last year uh, to require that they you know people with mental illness not be remain in a jail facility for more than 48 hours they have to be moved into a hospital or treatment type setting but which is good from that standpoint, but it's exacerbated the backup for those who are not picked up in jail, but who also still need to get into hospital settings. Uh, so uh, we're going to be working on a number of things. Uh, Senator Goodwin um, does have, I think it's three bills um, that uh, she's packaged that were introduced in the Senate uh, or will be on the introductions tomorrow. And uh, we've got a hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee scheduled uh, for Tuesday on those bills. Um, an important part of that is, a, is like a pre-jail diversion program. So then rather than taking them to the, the jails, they can be taken directly to other settings so that even if they're being arrested for a crime or suspected of a crime, they don't have to go through that booking process. They can be put into better settings and it, it's to set up some of these facilities around the state to make that happen. The other thing I'll comment on is the CIT program uh, because I, I've met with staff at, in the prisons and listen to them describe how with their CIT training they have been able to diffuse situations that would otherwise have escalated severely um, and could have caused harm to the person who was having you know a, a, an experience that day and to others around that prisoner as well including the staff uh, so uh, and the, the uh, St. Louis Park uh, firefighters and, and police department have also been uh, going through some of the CIT training. So it's happening, um, but there's always a funding issue when it comes to training, and we need to make sure there's <coughs> adequate funding in the fire safety account and other places to enable um, our first responders in the community to get that kind of training too, so they can defuse the situations, hopefully at the door, uh, before it escalates too uh, seriously. And I know last. Uh not last year, but the year before in the budget cycle, um, with the leadership of Sarah Latz, we put more money into the po Police Officer Standards Training Board. So they have some money for city police state, city police to get reimbursed for some of the training, but it's never, never enough. So. so before we go on to the next topic, let's welcome back Representative Winkler. Um, Go ahead, right ahead. Say yeah, you well, thank you for uh, being entertained by my opening act uh, for so long. Uh, and I'm sorry for being late. I'm sure Cheryl passed on that I was stuck in a meeting at the Capitol, and sometimes when you're presenting in front of people, you can't just say I have to walk out the door. So I apologize for being late. Uh, Ryan Winkler, I was uh, reelected this fall to District 46A, which is parts of Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, Plymouth, and Medicine Lake. I live in Golden Valley, married three children. This is my fifth term in the legislature and uh, serving in the minority in the state house for the second time. And uh, really excited to have Cheryl join us. It's too bad to come in, uh, not getting <laughs> able to, being able to work on big legislation, but it's a good learning experience too. And um, we have uh, a lot of work in front of us again, a budget to pass, a um, state economy that's growing but still leaving a lot of people behind and we need to continue the work to make Minnesota a place uh, that values hard work and uh, responsibility 
And uh, so we're going to keep pushing that even if, uh, as a Democrat, I'm not in the House majority. But uh, we have work to do, and I think we'll be able to accomplish a lot of things on a bipartisan basis. We're going to certainly disagree on things as well. But um, uh, if you have any uh, issues or concerns or work that you would like us to focus on, we want to hear it tonight. And always feel free to be in touch with us in St. Paul. So thanks very much again for uh, coming tonight. And uh, on with the my committees. There was a request from the audience. Uh, this year, I serve on three committees instead of seven, which I served on last time. But you're happy for that. Huh? Yeah, it's a difference. <laughs> I, I serve on uh, education policy higher education policy and finance, and the Public Safety Committee, which includes judiciary and the courts as well. So uh, a little bit of change from some of my past work. I look forward to being an understudy to both Cheryl and Ron, who are more expert in the public safety area than I am. I'm going to need your help in the House. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Elaine Wynn from Golden Valley. And I wanted to just say I'm very much in favor of keeping a big surplus. Uh, I think the state was very destabilized by pu putting it into tax cuts about 15 years ago, and uh, the last 10-year cycle was really h rough uh, in regard to that. I wanted to just bring up a, a couple of um, bills that are are in uh, the Senate. Um, one of them is in bo also in the House, Cheryl told me today now. Um, I thought that I knew that we had an Equal Rights Amendment. And imagine my surprise last summer to find that, in fact, the Equal Rights Amendment, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, with the, um, where making it illegal to um, discriminate on the basis of gender, had actually never been ratified. There are states going about it now. Um, Oregon passed it, and uh, Illinois just defeated it again. Um, in their House representatives. So <clears throat> there is, and thank you, uh, uh, Cheryl, for going on the bill in the House today. And uh, thank you, Ron, for, for uh, getting both of those bills out and, and supporting them. The, um, one of them is a memorial resolution of Congress, which says there, there's a sunset provision. We're going to run out of time before the, the states that haven't um, ratified this uh, get a chance to even vote on it. So the resolution is to request that, and uh, that's Senate File 113, and definitely, of course, uh, supporting that. Uh, please do. And um, then there is the resolution to put on the ballot for next year uh, an equal rights amendment. Um, <laughs> what I want to say, uh, a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution of the state of Minnesota. And I, generally, I'm really opposed to uh, constitutional amendments for small things. I don't think this is a small thing. This is at least half of the population of Minnesota. And one of the things about discrimination, um, the 187 countries passed with the United Nations and that, that's stated in the bill uh, uh, through the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. 187 countries have passed that. We don't have it in the United States as of right now. And I, I think that as an issue of fairness, it's, you know, it's kind of uh, just out there. It, it, it is such an issue of fairness. But it seems to me that it's an issue of economics in the state, too. There are more and more women, not only women who are single parents, but in many families, women are the major um, wage earner. And when you think about what this means uh, to the state uh, to have women making 10000 20000 30 50 whatever it ends up being, less per year in a job where they're sometimes doing more work uh, in, the same, uh, in the same category. So I want to tell you that <clears throat> that's the other one. I understand we're still looking for the sponsorship in the House to settle in. I don't know how that, how that is going to work out, but that's, that's the, um, let's see, 
Senate File 93, I guess, is, is that. So whatever you have to say about that, this is going to be a hot, very important issue. And I've got some other ones, but this one is not about money. It's, it's about what's fair. Well, thank you, Elaine. Um, and uh, former Representative Betty Foliard was at the Capitol this week uh, lobbying on behalf of, of these issues, and uh, she asked me to second author uh, the two Senate bills. So I'm now um, the second author on both of the Senate bills that address these issues, and I'm proud to, to uh, be an advocate uh, for equal rights for women. And I know Representative Winkler and I are both on the one that's in the House, and we're just waiting for the other one to show up, I think. We'll be strong supporters of it. Um, before we go on, I should note, I, I believe I saw our County Commissioner, Marion Green, come in. Um, are you here? Thank you for joining us. Glad to have you here. All right. <laughs> Good. All right. Go ahead, sir. Evening. Uh, my name is Nino Pedrelli, uh, resident of St. Louis Park. And uh, first of all, thank you for passing the 5% campaign last year. That really helps. Um, our concern is uh, we have a uh, daughter, an adult daughter with uh, disabilities and uh, lives in a group home, and which is really turning out great. Um, and our concern is that uh, we've been hearing rumblings about uh, this year of either funding shifts or reimbursement uh, changes that go to the service providers. And so we just like you to keep an eye out for that stuff as far as uh, what goes on there. Um, that's it. That's a very short one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Lenius. I am a resident of Golden Valley. And you might not think it to look at me, but I am a college student. I am what is known as a non-traditional college student. I am attending Metropolitan State University in St. Paul. I will be graduating, completing my bachelor's degree that I started 40 years ago, and I will graduate next May. Now that I have experienced Metro State, I have a newfound appreciation for the Minnesota State College system in general and for Metropolitan State University in particular. I believe they are an underappreciated gem of a university. They, they have some educational philosophies over there that are they're rare in academia. There are only like five schools in the country that f kind of follow these academic philosophies but they are perfectly tailored for non-traditional students like me. Um, I'm sorry, my phone just banged out. That's how we could tell that you were a college student, because you used your phone for your notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Metro State is truly a global campus. I, I am just uh, continually amazed at how many segments of society they are serving. I have met fellow students from every continent except Antarctica. And you know, all, all ages, all religions, all cultures, all classes, all economic levels. It's th they, they benefit a great cross-section of students. Here is a statistic I found very interesting when I heard it. 25% of Minnesotans have a bachelor's degree. 74%, I think I'm remembering this right, have some college, meaning they could complete their degree you know, easily. And Metro State is set up to serve those kinds of students. They, they also get some right out of high school, but the great proportion of them are people like me who didn't finish the bachelor's degree for some reason and have decided they want to do it. Uh, this is the type of student that they are set up to serve, and I think they serve them very well. So as you formulate budgets, I would like to emphasize, I mean, not just this session, but going forward. Metro State is very worthy of legislative support. Representative Winkler, you mentioned not leaving people behind. I think Metro State is an amazing resource for helping people better themselves. And, you know, I, I have seen that happen with, with my fellow students. I also want to mention that in a community leadership class I took last fall, I used the last of these town meetings with Ryan and Ron and Steve Simon as an example of ethical political leadership. I walked out of that town hall forum 
feeling, you know, really good about the three guys who were up there who were representing me. So when this assignment came up in the class, I thought, oh, okay, I know what I'm going to write about. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You know, it's a good jumping off point for higher education uh, discussion altogether and, and funding. Uh, you know, the governor has, um, uh, has indicated his support for uh, strong higher education funding. Um, one of the uh, Senate proposals um, is to uh, make uh, free the first two years of, of higher education in the, in the vote tech system, um, which is part of MinSKU. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the other institutions are all coming in asking for the, you know, the University of Minnesota and the MinSKU system generally are coming in asking for enough funding so that they can hold tuition um, at its current levels. Uh, continue a tuition freeze. Uh, I'm not sure there's going to be enough money to do all of that um, to provide free education at Votech and at the same time uh, fund the higher ed institutions enough uh, to hold tuition at its current levels. I'm not sure there'll be enough money even just to do the tuition freeze levels even without the Votech piece of it. But it opens up an important discussion about the importance of getting education beyond high school. Um, and that everyone ought to have that opportunity, and uh, including getting college credit while they're in high school um, for those who are at that level of, of uh, capability uh, that can reduce their costs of getting their, their, uh, uh, their post high school degrees uh, quite substantially, um, whether it's college in the schools or whether it's a post secondary educational options going out of the high school during the school day to a higher ed institution. There are a lot of options there uh, that can be looked at. Uh, so we, we can have a lot of uh, uh, vigorous and interesting discussions about funding higher education this year. And we see some of the payback just in today's newspaper on the University of Minnesota being recognized in the top 25 in the nation in public research universities. Uh, and the $741 million they brought in um, in the last cycle uh, of uh, research funding from a variety of sources, including uh, the National Institutes of Health and, and the federal government. Um, so that pays dividends in this state in terms of workforce development. Uh, you know, if you ask 3M what's their biggest concern, it's not taxes. It's having a qualified and well-educated workforce because they are a research company and they need to have the people to do the research that develops the products um, that they're able to use. In fact, I was just at the dentist the other day with my seven-year-old, and the dentist recommended uh, getting a, a plastic-type covering on her back, on her molars, uh, because she's prone to cavities. And if they get this plastic covering in there, it will help protect against cavities, which will save a whole lot of things, money as well as aggravation. And the product was developed at 3M. All right, so we've got a lot of gems uh, in this state, and uh, the higher education as well as K-12 is a real key to making sure we have the workforce uh, to keep our economic development moving forward. i just add something to the higher ed discussion. I'm starting my second term on the Higher Education Committee, and I just want to say, first of all, it's really good to hear your really positive feedback on how Metro State is uh, operating and the kind of opportunity it's providing. Uh, we hear so much, or we focus so heavily these days on the cost of higher education and some of the challenges that the institutions are having. Of course, we work on problems at the legislature most of the time. So it's just really good to hear that that uh, state college, uh, state university uh, that you're attending is, is delivering for you. Um, we had testimony today. Uh, in Minnesota, the average debt a student graduates with a bachelor's degree is $27,000. That's the average. Uh, for an associate's degree, it's I think it was something like uh, $19,000 or something like that. Um, we have seen a, I think that tuition has increased something like three times the rate of inflation and population and economic growth over the last 10 years. Partly that's because the legislature has cut funding for higher education up until two years ago when we had the first significant funding increase. But the fact of the matter is that the the model that the higher ed institutions have, which is to continue to expand and grow and to provide more services and add on more layers of duplication, increases their costs. Declining uh, funding from the legislature uh, together 
lead students to take on massive debt to get educations that they don't get enough guidance for on what they should be doing in order to get a good job that will actually pay that off. And so we do have big challenges in higher ed that we're trying to tackle. The research has been one thing um, <coughs> in past years that we were worried about. And so we're starting to see some returns on the focus that we've had in higher ed. So affordability is really going to continue to be, I think, the top priority that we have. But it's good to hear that uh, while we focus on affordability, you're getting a great product. Yeah higher ed was the one committee I really wanted to be on that I didn't get on, not just because I have one child at U of M Morris, one going to U of M Morris next year, and two years behind that, another one going off to college. So it's very personal, um, the debt that they could be in incurring. But also, I have a similar story. It was great to hear you say about Metro State. I left college in 92 with all my credits to get my bachelor's, but I hadn't passed a language equivalency. I got a full-time job, got married, started having kids, never went back until about five years ago. I finished my degree at through Metro State, at the, but transferred the credits into the U of M Journalism School just so I could show my children that I could finish something that I started. So <laughs> <laughs> Metro State was is a great asset to the community, and I think we spend a lot of time, rightfully so, on E through 12, and I've been a huge proponent. My husband's a high school teacher, getting kids ready for some for higher education, but higher education is not going to look the same for everybody. So we need to have all those different models out there for kids to have access to them <coughs> and make sure that they're not just burying themselves in a mountain of debt, because right now they really do only have two choices. Take your, take your high school degree and go get a minimum wage job or decide to have a pile of debt and go get a college degree and facing <coughs> a workforce that's not going to help them pay it back. So we really need to, to change that. We have a lot of connections to Metro State. I neglected to mention that my mother got her degree, her bachelor's from Metro State <laughs> midlife as well, uh, rolling in credits from when she had taken a few years of college and getting credit for life experience she had. She was able to, uh, to, to jump start from that. So. My wife once taught one class one semester. <laughs> 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 like there, you got the trifecta right separation here. separation right there. Yeah. I just live a few miles from Metro State. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Great segue. Um, my name is Margaret Rogg. I live in St. Louis Park. And I would like to speak briefly about technical education, specifically women in technical education. I think Minnesota has an opportunity, a really great opportunity to be a leader in helping women enter non-traditional careers. I was really happy to see the recent uh, funding that came through the state for the, through the Women's Economic Security Act. Um, that provided, I think, almost half a million dollars for funding to do just that. But that's a small amount. And the opportunities for this particular um, pathway, this particular emphasis, and this opportunity for Minnesota to be a leader are huge. Careers in technical education, jobs in technical fields like construction, manufacturing, um, computers, Folks with just a two-year degree, and I know this for a fact, come out of um, colleges, Dunwoody College, um, other colleges with uh, salaries, starting salaries of $40,000 or higher consistently, and earn salaries that are considerably higher, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 within just a few years of getting their two-year degree. These are great jobs with great opportunities, and they have the opportunity to really impact the many single women we have in this state, single women with dependent children. You all know the statistics, but I think it's like 70, almost 80% of uh, women of color who are mothers are single mothers. And so if we could find a way in this state to really intentionally um, direct resources toward helping women of color and low-income women enter programs that train them in technical fields, we could have an economic impact on the whole communities and states because this would raise the incomes of these women and improve outcomes for their children. So um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. And as, as I say, Minnesota's already started on that path. And it doesn't seem to be too controversial. So it seems like something that, you know, in a divided legislature would be possible because the benefits really accrue to 
to the people that need it most. And that's what I have to say. Thank you, Margaret. I do have one more thing I wrote on my sheet here just again to bring the point home. It's so shocking the low percentages of women in non-traditional careers. Like in Minnesota, 1% of auto technicians are women. 1%, I'm sorry, in the Twin Cities, 1%. In construction management, it's like 3%. And in, uh, if the, the, the percentages are just shockingly low in this supposedly egalitarian society that we have. So again, a real opportunity to erase the stigma, to change the, turn the tide, and just have a real impact and for Minnesota to be a leader. Thank you. And there, I'm glad you brought up, like, it's interesting that you brought up the auto technicians. I was just reading an article. Um, there, the workforce is empty. They're losing people. In fact, there's a bigger um, business that's coming in that does auto technicians, and they're giving signing bonuses because they're having such a hard time finding technicians. So, yes, it'd be fantastic to be able to get more people into those fields that we need, especially if it's women that need need the jobs. I would I just put in a plug on another point, which is that we students make decisions, kids make decisions about what they want to do based on myth and folklore, not based on <laughs> an understanding of what is out there. And a teenage uh, you, brain. You, yeah, and a teenage <laughs> brain. And so we part of this is affordability. I mean, they're making really high stakes uh, guesses about what they can be when they grow up and don't really have, you know, because of the debt involved, might not have an opportunity to change it. But we also have uh, what, the second lowest ratio of counselors to students in our schools in America, in Minnesota. And if, and if you want to, I mean, that's one good place for kids to actually get some information about what's out there. Because I don't think it's because they are not going to hire women or they're not going to admit women into their programs. It's because people don't think of these things as being desirable or stable places to work. Or, right, stereotypes. So it's, I think to that point, I think it gets to the point we've got to get more information and education to young people about what the world of work actually looks like mm -hmm. for them and what fields might be better than a four-year degree in psychology that costs you $30,000 in debt. Yeah. 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 Yep. Oh, hi. My name is John Cummings. I'm the founder of Minnesotans for Safe Driving, uh, resident of St. Louis Park. Our uh, office is in St. Louis Park. I want to thank Ron for having that informational meeting at the Judiciary Committee yesterday on the interlock system. Uh, they need a lot of information I, <laughs> I got from the meeting yesterday, and uh, you can provide it. I'm glad I waited until Representative Winkler got here. I didn't realize you are on the public safety in the House. Um, you've been involved in this issue for a long time. We're victim advocates and uh, proponents for safe driving. And uh, we're on the um, Hennepin County DWI court team. We're on the DWI task force. Been doing this a long time. And the biggest single thing that's ever happened since I've been involved in this is that interlock. That is saving lives. It is changing lives. And if we can get the cost down and, and get it more available to people and get that insurance stigma out of there, if we can convince insurance companies that these are probably some of the safest drivers out there, we're going to be way ahead of the game. And I thank you, and uh, thanks for all your help with all the different things you've done for us. So keep going, and uh, if you need any information or anything, we can do anything to help, just give us a call, okay? Thank thanks, John. I'm, I'm glad you, you brought it up um, because cost has been a factor. Oh, you know, and another thing, you're talking about the uh, corrections. Yeah, it, it's so full. Well. The interlock will help keep people from going to prison. That's right. It's gonna, it's gonna, it saves money, huge money. So That's right. And, and part of our challenge from a policy standpoint is to remove the barriers uh, to people um, who ought to have the ignition interlock but choose not to. Uh, you know, the law is right now if you have a certain number of DWIs or if you have a first-timer with a high test, uh, you're mandated to use the ignition interlock if you want to get your license back um, yeah. before your revocation period is over. Uh, the ignition interlock is, is, is thank you, is a, uh, um, it's an electronic device that you put in the car that the driver has to blow into to demonstrate that they don't have any alcohol in their system before the car will start. So it basically prevents people who've been drinking from getting behind the wheel and driving their car. Uh, and 
But there are a number of issues uh, and a lot of proposals this year surrounding the whole range of, of DWIs and public safety, and that's going to be a centerpiece of the way we address things. Um, you know, even before the meeting started today, one of the people who was here uh, told me about an experience um, of her family member um, where they were on ignition interlock, but the device was so mechanically unreliable that it became a real barrier and a real headache for the whole family. Uh, and so it's, it's important that I hear these stories, get this information, because then I can, as chair of the committee, I can put pressure on the Department of Public Safety to increase their oversight and improve the accountability of the providers of the ignition interlock devices themselves. Exactly, and it's well. like any, any technology, it's, it's improving all the time. When it first came out, it was, it was, we've got people that will testify, it's a monster. But it allowed them to keep their jobs, it allowed them to move on with their lives, and also kept them away from the booze and helped them with their recovery. And we, we also know statistically there are a lot of people who choose to drive without a valid license after they've been revoked, um, and then often driving without insurance, sure. because they have to make that choice. Uh, am, am I going to keep my job? Am I going to put food on the table and pay my mortgage or my rent? Uh, um, or am I going to not drive at all? And they choose to drive and take the chance that they won't be caught right. um, driving after revocation. I mean, that's just the reality of it, whether it's lawful or not. And the ignition interlock is a device that allows people to drive lawfully and keep their jobs. And with insurance. And with insurance. Because if, if they run into you and, and, and they don't have insurance and you don't have enough insurance, your life changes forever. So this is real serious business. And like I say, this, this is the single biggest thing and the numbers prove it. The numbers keep going down. Less and less people are dying out there because, because we're take, starting to take this seriously. But there's still too many. One is too many because none of this stuff has to happen. You know? We have seen um, the incidence of DWI go from a high of around 45 or 46,000 per year in Minnesota down to the last uh, statistical year about 26,000 right. uh, per year. So we're moving in the right direction. Right, and um, what, and 113 we'll be, people were killed last year? Right, I mean, which, which is better than it was in the past, but still an unacceptably still high unacceptable, number. Right. I mean, no number is acceptable. Uh, we're going to have a lot of proposals on the table this year uh, from going to 0 0.16 right. uh, for, uh, as the aggravating level for first-time gross misdemeanor uh, to forfeiture reform that will allow people to keep their vehicles so that they can drive to keep their work with the ignition interlock, um, to proposals relating to plate impoundments, um, removing some of the insurance requirements for those who don't have a history of insurance problems so that they can get that ignition interlock device and get their license valid. Exactly. Um, so th there's going to be a whole lot of proposals this year, uh, and, and we'll be taking a close look at the whole system. But I just wanted to say it's one of the, one of the a after being involved in this for a long time, that's the single biggest step forward that we've made. And it's because and, and I see it personally every day, um, working with multiple offenders in DWI court, and these are the people who are, their next step is going to prison. And we're keeping them from going to prison with this. Right. And that's saving us all a lot of money. Well, and the DWI court itself is, is a, a great uh, place because they can wrap a whole lot of the services around the prevention side of the equation. Exactly. Rather than just locking people up or just letting them go with minimal oversight, there's a constant stream of, of accountability and services uh, with probation and, and others. Yeah, I've truly been amazed being involved in it and seeing the changes and, and the lives that they're saving and the families that they're saving. And also, I'd like to say Metro State, that's a... That's a hell of a good uh, university because they have me come there and speak every year. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank I'm, you. I'm sensing a trend. <laughs> First, I want to thank you so much for all your work, too. And hopefully with the technology changing, the price does come down because I know that's a great barrier. It's a little over $100 a month, if I can remember, to have a device in your car. And then if you have more than one car in the family that you have to put device in. And I think we changed some laws about work vehicles. But... Um, of you have to kind of rat yourself out to your insurance company yeah. to get the certificate, you know, and, and insurance companies should realize that these people are safe drivers. Yes. Maybe they should give them a discount for putting it in. <laughs> That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Hi, good evening. I'm Sarah Davis. I live in St. Louis Park, um, and I'm also an attorney. I'm a youth advocate at the Legal Rights Center in Minneapolis. Um, 
there's so many important issues to talk about, but I know there's people behind me in line and we're running short on time, so I'll just keep it short. I really just wanted to talk a little bit about juvenile justice. Um, it's an incredibly important issue. Um, and there are some reforms that are going to be coming to the legislature this year. Um, the, you know, these are reforms that focus on really improving outcomes for youth and our communities. Um, they touch on, you know, the really evidence-based best practices that kind of run the gamut from how young people enter the system to what happens when they're in the system and to how we can support them as they're exiting the juvenile justice system to go on to become productive members of our community. Um, and these reforms really are going to promote public safety, better outcomes for youth, and really do promote cost savings for government. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, these are coming, at, you know, Senator Latz, I know that you've been a big supporter in the past, and we really appreciate that, and, you know, I just really hope that we can count on the support from all of you going forward. Um, you know, these, there's a lot of things that we can be doing um, differently and better, and Minnesota historically really has been a leader for the for the nation and juvenile justice and so we want to continue to be in that position and so look forward to continuing the conversation but just wanted to raise that as something that is very important to me personally so thank you thank you sir that's i was just going to point out um throw that out there as i'm anxiously awaiting i had put in to be on the juvenile justice advisory task force and i'm just waiting for the okay from the new majority to see if i get put on it so thank you for your work Michael, do you want to come up? Hi, I'm. <laughs> Will it stay? Hi, guys. Good to see you. Congratulations, Cheryl. Um, I'm Judy Reiner. I want to say, give a compliment first to a state worker. You know how we always hear that government workers don't work? Well, let me tell you, Christy Novak in the House Outreach and Information area, fabulous. She said this wouldn't, this directory won't come out till February, but I'm on the list. She sent me all of this. And then she called on New Year's Day to give me more information on a message I had left. Wow, they do work at the state capitol, let me tell you. I'm so proud of her. Called and complimented her today. So please, you know, give a boost to your workers. They're really great. Um, the material that's been left in front of you pertains to um, some areas that we're looking at lobbying on in a larger in a larger way, a lot of us have done individual, you see the name <coughs> under senior citizens, Aging and Long-Term Care Policy Committee. Yes, I have been doing this with the state ombudsman, but we need to expand it. Under immigrants and immigration, this is what I need from you guys, is what committees would be relevant in the state uh, house and the state senate for this. I know that um, Marion has worked, Marion Green, you have worked recently on a Somali event, or you tried to get a majority, couldn't quite get it, but still working on it. Thank you, Marion. But what any, anything you think would relate to immigrant or immigrations, maybe health and human services. I don't know the committees. That's what I want from you. In the area of environment, yes, there's the en Environment, Natural Resources, Policy, and Finance Committee. And we've had so many people, Judith Moore, Elaine Wynn, Julie um, Iverson, uh, <laughs> Jeannie Iverson, have all worked. And you, you came, Ryan, and brought another legislator and talked about renewables, I think, at one particular point when we wanted information. So that committee does stand. And in uh, long-term care stands, agriculture. Why would suburban people care about it? Well, because the farmers are a huge part of our economy. And they often, outstay area doesn't have the resources. They don't have the things that they need for so many things. So we've decided to, decided to take that on as a topic. And then this whole idea came from dun, da, 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 Michael present, Logan. How about I present the last, the last one? <laughs> he thought it would be good instead of just having one person here and there or a couple people here and there working on these issues that we actually organize in a better fashion and come forward to all these committees and follow things. So what we need from you is what committees would be relevant to these areas. How That's it. How about, how about I the last one? I okay, why don't you go up to the mic? Specific thing and less broad. Um, I discussed it with, with you earlier, earlier this week, we're wrong actually. Um, well, I think last week, now that I think about, about it. Um, basically, for the last point, point especially, I was just wondering which, I, kn I know that you, you pointed me to which com committee uh, the, the com Health and Human Services co Committee and a specific member on to talk to. But I was also wondering, um, beyond, the, beyond that, that, after I go, go there, which, where, who you'd recommend talking with ab about uh, outreach, but which, do you want me to kind of describe, describe that again? I remember I did, did so. Yeah, how would I describe Give that? Give us a topic. So that Basically, um, the Affordable Care Act gives a great many, many lovely resources to, to Minnesotans and to those mo 
uh, mo in most need of them, as well as also saving money for the state of Minnesota because it allows people to do preventative care, care instead of having to go into the emergency room, which is wonderful. Several one and the state of Minnesota, in turn, has done a wonderful job of directing people to Minsher as a resource. And these are all wonderful things, but there's, exact, but there's one little problem with it, which is that educating people that these resources now exist, unfortunately, there's no federal funding for that. And so the, there are currently a surprisingly large percentage of, of people in vulnerable positions who are unaware that they are now covered by various insurance schemes so they don't come in for the preventive care. So we're still seeing large numbers of people coming into the emergency room instead of doing preventive care. So this would be a proposal for the idea of, of having people, basically people in outreach, so that they would go out to the, these, these people because unfortunately these very vulnerable people don't have TVs, don't necessarily read the newspaper, and do not have radios. As a result of the, this, it's hard to get in contact with them without doing some form of outreach. And so the basic idea would be, for the last one, would be, I was wondering who should I talk to, or some ideas about who I would, would talk to about stirring up, up a bill or getting a, a ball rolling for the idea of some sort of outreach for education of Minnesotans, specifically those with resources that do not know it yet. Well, thank you for the question, Michael. And, um, you know, the. the the resources are provided through Minsure, and probably Minsure um, and, and the board of Minsure um, ought to be taking the lead, in my judgment, in uh, reaching out to make sure that those who can benefit from what they're providing uh, know about it and know what opportunities they have. Uh, and uh, Department of Human Services um, is also involved in, in that whole process. Uh, so those are really the two agencies I would think would be most appropriate uh, to tackle those issues. Thank you very much, then. Oh, yes. All right, thank you. Got uh, just about 15 minutes left, just so we can keep uh, an eye on the clock for folks, so we can answer as many questions or address as many issues as we can. Hello. I'm Diane Steen Hinderley, St. Louis Park, and I'm going to start out with a bit of humor, but it segues perfectly into my topic. Um, maybe some of you noticed that uh, Pope Francis, at about Christmas time, he um, chided uh, the governing body of the Vatican, um, saying that he thinks they feel a bit immortal, and says a body, that's the governing body of the Vatican, a body that does not practice self criticism does not keep up to date, does not try to better itself, is an infirm body. And that, I think, applies to our secular governing bodies, too, that we always have to be aiming for more and better democracy. And uh, I'm very concerned about rank choice voting. Uh, and Steve Simon was a real champion for this, but now he's moved on to higher office, so he's not there. And I hope that all three of you will um, pick up the slack that he almost single-handedly was <laughs> uh, doing so well at. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about the spoiler factor in executive races. I think that's the, it's almost like an emergency, I feel, for our, our culture over here in America. And um, so I hope you'll uh, do the best that you can to advance this necessary step in our democracy to uh, modernize our democracy. One reason why Norway has all this um, advancement in a lot of European countries is because they're always making their democracy more fine-tuned to serve the electorate better. And we kind of just stick with the same old thing too much. Um, and I don't have the bill numbers, but uh, Fair Vote Vin Minnesota, who's like the overall shepherd of <coughs> this effort, they're going to get back to me with the bill numbers. So you will be hearing from me as soon as I know those. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Do you want to come? Yeah, thanks, Diane. And um, I have to reassure you that I remain a skeptic of ranked choice voting. Um, you voted the right way. <laughs> well, technically, I did, but I think I put on the record that I did that as a courtesy to my seatmate, Steve Simon. And so uh, I may be convinced to sort of move it along, but. Um, uh, I'm not going to probably pick up a slack and remain a skeptic, but I still believe in improving democracy as much as we can. 
Yeah, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> and puppies. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Warren Ulrich. I'm a resident of St. Louis Park. And uh, my wife and I happen to be driving in the what I consider northern metro. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong. That I consider Champlin to be part of the northern metro. Their gas prices up there were $1.69 a gallon. And all around where I live and where I travel in St. Louis Park, 191 to 199 And I thought there was supposed to be about an $0.08 cent difference between the high and the low, unless that's changed. And I'm wondering how gas stations, uh, and that was not the only station that was that low up in the Champlain area, but I'm wondering how gas prices can vary that much uh, at all, period, in the metro area. I'm trying to remember the law on the topic. There is not a there's not a, a mandate of a, a cap or an eight cent difference in the mandate. I mean, but there is a law that prevents gas stations from pricing their gas. I believe it's below their wholesale cost, uh, so that they can't, in the short term, try to run right. the gas station right. across the street and that's out of business and then let the cost go up. I thought there was like an eight cent, where you know there's so supposed to be some sort of an eight cent gap in there. I think that's but related. I've heard from years ago. I think that's related to the floor, um, and uh, that that I referred to. Uh, but there isn't any law that says that there has to be only eight cent difference between the lowest price in the state and the highest price in the state. It's really up to the individual gas stations beyond that to, uh, to compete. Now, I can't tell you why those Champlin stations have a price war going on. That's well, I also know in, in other southern parts metro, of the metro uh, area. Burnsville, uh, Apple Valley, uh, their prices are definitely lower than Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, in the center part of the metro area. Uh, they're, they're always lawyer, lower. And I'm finding that the gas prices up north, uh, when, when I do get up there occasionally, seem to be lower, but this was surprisingly different than what, what I saw, and we checked the gas price on our way up to Champlin. The best I saw was 189, and we get up there and see 169. And so I'm thinking, well, why can't all the gas stations, and, and these were not uh, like Holidays or Super Americas, these were small stations uh, selling their gas at that price. Why can't the rest of them drop it down? <laughs> Well, you know, some of the stations have have independent sources um, of gas as well, and, and, and you know that aren't part of the holiday or the SA uh, systems. I know sometimes the vendors don't get it. Sometimes they wait till the end of the business day to drop it for the next day. So right. it, it could have been that, but I have. I would say, and this is I don't mean to be too flip about it, but I think the reason they charge more is because they can. And for whatever reason, they feel like they can get by with charging more in this area than they can get by with in, you know, collar communities around the Twin Cities. But, you know, my assumption is that it's because that's what the market will bear. Well, but I don't want to drive 30-some miles to get uh, a 20-cent gas <laughs> no. difference. Which is uh, why you're willing to pay more <laughs> here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sort of forced to, I think. Um, <laughs> is the uh, pipeline that I've, I've read about uh, going to be an issue that they want to try to build in the state of Minnesota? Is that something that's going to be coming up this year, maybe? Well, yeah, I, I think that the issue is that, I mean, that's going through an environmental review process and there's citizen comment going on. I think the only way it's likely to come to the legislature is if somebody proposes a bill to circumvent the environmental review process and just say we should permit this without finishing the review. I suspect that that I would not be surprised to see that introduced and move uh, fairly quickly in the Minnesota House potentially, but I don't think in the end the governor would agree to undermine his agencies who are doing the environmental review and, sor and short circuit that. So I think it's unlikely to be an issue that moves very far. I'd also like to make a suggestion that if it gets into a situation where it's pretty close, is it somehow that it's stipulated that the owners president of the, these companies that are going to put in the pipeline live in the state right on top of the pipeline for uh, at least 10 years after it's put in. And they can drink the water and, and so on and so forth in the environment where their pipeline is laying. 
Well, it is an interesting dynamic. We probably won't see the legislative action on it, but the question of safety and environmental impact of pipeline versus rail. Um, right. And, uh, you know, rail carrying um, the, uh, the Bakken crude, uh, which is a light and flammable oil, uh, is, uh, those would argue that it's more dangerous uh, to individual public safety as well as the environment than a pipeline would be. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how all of this plays out. One, one more thing, uh, and I know there's talk, uh, I don't know how serious it is, it's been brought up that uh, uh, certain people are pushing uh, in the state legislature uh, to have no session going for 2016. <laughs> uh, and I'm just wondering if these people, what they plan to do if there is no session, I mean, and, and do they get paid on top of that? <laughs> You know, that's a good question. I should ask Senator Han whether he uh, plans to forfeit his salary for the, uh, the 2017 uh, session that he doesn't want to happen. I think there's zero chance of that happening. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why we meet every year, and that's because things need to be updated, changed, fixed. Uh, new problems arise that need to be addressed. Uh, and typically, the, uh, the bonding bill is done in the non-budget year as well. And the, it takes a long time to assess the viability and, and, and advisability of bonding projects. Uh, so you know, we could see a much shorter session in the spring of 2017. There's been some proposals. Maybe we start after a spring recess and then go until the constitutional adjournment date toward the end of May. Uh, and maybe we could look at something like that. Um, but I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think it'd be good, frankly to take a whole I year off. I agree with that. Uh, I, mean, I, I just, you know, uh, a lot of what we do is just correct uh, minor errors that you know, occurred during the, uh, the previous year uh, or when you get some experience with stuff that, that's being implemented in its first year. We've all had this come up where you've got to make some course corrections. Well, I, I just figure the uh, people that suggested this uh, evidently have talked to the people in the, uh, U.S. Congress that uh, <laughs> didn't work too many days a week uh, back in the early 2000s. So uh, I just figured what, that suggestion uh, just puzzles me. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see how they get a bonding bill done. Most of the projects are just being introduced to MMB right now, and then they go through all the tours. Uh, the Capital Investment Committee goes to the tours in the summer and the fall to see the projects so that they can make a good decision and, and you know, session is there for a reason but as you all know we don't work for you just during session we work for you all year round so i don't know why there's such a push to not have session next year except that i think some of them are frustrated already with the construction in the capitol last comment or yes, question? I'll be brief. Hi, my name is Corey Rudapenning. I'm a resident of St. Louis Park and grew up in Hopkins and got to work with Cheryl back in the day. So it's good to see you again. I Congratulations. You. Um, so I'll be brief. It was um, good to hear all of you speak about education and thinking about early childhood and also higher education. And um, in my personal and professional life, I'm really um, working on looking at the high school graduation rate in Minnesota and the fact that while Minnesota has been a leader in education, we have one of the largest achievement gaps um, in this state. And so um, our students of color are not graduating high school at the rates of our white students. And so um, wanted to advocate that any pieces of legislation that actually come through this session that look at really targeting the achievement gap and how we really make sure that all young people can graduate from high school um, is really important. Um, and I'm really open to any promising legislation that you think might come up this session um, that would address that issue. Thank you. Well, those diverse communities are going to be paying for our Social Security when, uh, when we get to that age, and so it's in everyone's self-interest um, as well as the community's interest that, uh, that uh, we close that achievement gap so all the communities can have a, an opportunity for a successful life. And I would add, I think the good news is uh, the achievement gap and this, and this difference between how uh, white middle class students do compared to students of color and poor students is the number one issue in education consistently on both sides, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, there are some pretty uh, significant differences of opinion in some areas about what the best way to target that and to deal with it. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are very critical of the Federal No Child Left Behind Act. 
But the reality is that that uh, federal legislation is why we know so much about the difference between different groups of students and how well they perform. And it really is driving the public debate or the policy debate in, uh, at the Capitol about how to target this problem. So I think, uh, you know, there's going to be give and take and disagreements, but in the long run, I think we are going to start to have some pretty innovative policy. And we have some in place that's being started right now to tackle that, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. Yeah, and I, it's, this is something that I started at advocacy work over a dozen years ago in early childhood and, and K through 12, and it, we were talking about it then. They were talking about it before then. They're still talking about it now. Um, I think there's no magic bullet that's out there, and I think you were right when you said any legislation. There's, there's going to be different ways to address this, and there needs to be many different ways to address it, because one size does not fit all. That's the one thing we have learned. Um, but I still firmly believe early childhood is one of the best, most cost-effective ways to narrow the achievement gap, but that kind of leaves out the kids that are already in elementary school and high school that we have to look at, too. So I'm anxious to see. I, I don't serve on any education committees, but I'm still tracking it really closely. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. A great turnout, a full house, and uh, we appreciate your input. And as Ryan said earlier, we welcome your comments throughout the legislative session. We're all accessible at the Capitol by email or telephone or traditional U.S. snail mail. Uh, so by all means, stay in touch. And uh, I mean, I know I, for one, I think the others also send out email um, updates periodically during the legislative session. So if you aren't already on the email list serves, you can contact any of our offices and uh, we'll be happy to make sure we keep you up to date as much as we can during session as well. Thank you again and have a great evening. Thanks. Thank you.